Recording started. All right, so today we're going to start talking about molecular genetics. Now, molecular genetics has been used to analyze different things uh, correctly and in more dubious fashions. Um, one that I, I find interesting is uh, the comparisons of the human genome. They say that it varies by only 0.1% across the entire population. So our DNA is 99.9% .9 identical. So that means, you know, my DNA compared to, um, let's see, I don't know, uh, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, is 99.9% .9 identical uh, because we do look very similar. Anyway, um, now the arguments that have been presented because of these, these similarities is that, uh, you know, if there's a similar genetic sort of correspondence, um, that the ancestry uh, must be linked. Well, it's a sort of a dubious assumption. You know, um, if I'm 99.9% .9 similar to Dwayne Johnson, does that mean we have the same grandparents or the same great grandparents? Or the same great 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 grandparents? Uh, not necessarily so. Um, probably the genetic similarities are more connected to phenotypic, phenotypic similarities. Okay, because there's a, a similar structure and function. Um, so mammals would all be expected to have more similar genetics than mammals compared to amphibians. You know, in these comparisons, you know, you can look them up and you will find, yes, that's true. And uh, reptiles probably have more similar, uh, just because of their phenotypic similarities to um I would say quadrupeds than they would have to the bipeds. Now, since chimpanzees and humans are are bipeds and primates, and so have a lot of phenotypic phenotypic similarities, you could make a pretty good case that uh, you know the the phenotypic similarities um, are reflected in the genetic similarity. Uh, but again, those numbers are sometimes exaggerated to some extent because uh, you know I've also heard that human beings have about 50 percent um, genetic similarity to bananas so <laughs> I don't think you know bananas and human beings are very similar um, anyway but it's it's interesting and it's been used for, for arguments in different directions uh, rightly and wrongly but uh, I find it Humorous for the most part. And it says in the bottom here, um, even if you have a 3% difference, um, you know, the, the difference is because the, the genome is like billions of base pairs, you're going to have 3 million differences between individuals. Uh, so, anyway. Now, many single, many of the genetic... Differences between people are caused by mutations called single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs. Now, these are mostly harmless because they occur in the intron region of DNA. Now, DNA has two different sections, the intron and the exons. And it's very interesting that the, you know, the exon regions that are translated into proteins um, are spaced out by these introns. And a lot of geneticists feel this is a, a mutation uh, protection device. Okay, Since mutation can be so harmful, the body has developed this ability to uh, decrease the harmful effects of mutations. Because if the uh, mutation affects an intron, it's not translated into a protein anyway, so no big deal. But if it gets lucky, so to speak, and hits the exons, then it can affect structure and function of an important protein, and that's bad. Okay, now, human uniqueness is a result of DNA uh, mutations. Well, yeah, it's a result of DNA, 
Now that the DNA configuration is, is uh, you know, the result of mutations unproven. Anyway, DNA provides directions to provide growth uh, repair and ensures the continuity of life. DNA is the only molecule that's known um, is capable of replicating itself. So sugars, proteins, and fats cannot build duplicates of themselves, but DNA can. Now, 3 billion base pairs of DNA and 46 strands totaling 6 feet in length in every human cell. 3 billion, that's a lot. Okay, anyway, 100,000 genes on chromosomes that they know about. Okay, and uh, of course everything, the Human Genome Project did map out the complete genome, but it did not identify all of the genes. Uh, that's still in process as far as I know. Now, every time a cell divides, it must make a new set of DNA strands for a new cell. Now, some of the first dudes that uh, found this stuff out uh, was Watson and Crick. Okay, Watson entered the University of Chicago at 15 years old. So he was like super smart dude. Uh, in 1951, Watson met Crick at uh, the Cambridge University. They interpreted and synthesized two pieces of experimental information. They uh, used X-ray diffraction, Hawkins and Franklin, um, to determine DNA physical structure, also DNA's chemical structure. They found out that there's uh, an arrangement of nitrogen bases involved in DNA. Uh, they concluded that the number of adenine molecules equals the number of thymine. Now, adenine and thymine are both uh, types of bases, okay, um, nucleotide bases. And also that the guanine and the cytosine, hello, Sandy. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Sandy? Excellent. Okay, well, you missed a little bit, but not a lot. Anyway, we're talking about that there's equal proportions of adenine and thymine in DNA and equal proportions of guanine and cytosine. Now, this suggests that those nitrogen bases um, are arranged in pairs, so that adenine bonds with thymine in a pair and that guanine pairs with cytosine. Now, the three-dimensional DNA model came out of these discoveries, and it was introduced to the scientific community in 1953. Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize in 1962. It's considered by many the most significant discovery of the 20th century. Now, here we have the DNA molecule, and uh, its structure is referred to as a double helix. Okay, so that's a double helix there. Um, now, this pairing suggested to Watson and Crick uh, a mechanism for um, copying the genetic material. And we know that to be true today. Okay. Now, back in those days, they didn't really understand, you know, how DNA would unwind and replicate and then... Uh, it will sort itself out during during duplication. Now, chromosomes and DNA. Well, DNA is a molecule that makes up chromosomes. Now, chromosomes are tiny thread-like material that contains the DNA, and the DNA is made of two parts. Now, one part is the proteins, um, composed of 20 different amino acids by altering the sequence of uh, an amino acid, you can change a protein and nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, um, you know, are, are these four nitrogen bases that we talked about, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Okay, now DNA also has a deoxyribose sugar, makes up the backbone of the DNA molecule, and then it's attached to these nitrogen bases. Now, it's uh, good to remember that adenine and guanine are referred to as purines, 
and cytosine and thymine are referred to as pyrimidines. Here you can see uh, nucleic acid at the bottom. So let's have a look at that one. Nucleic acid. And here you have the sugar portion, the deoxyribose. Okay, so if we're talking about DNA, it's deoxyribose nucleic acid. That's what it means. Now the nucleic acid part's right here, the adenine. And then you have the phosphate group that helps compose the, the backbone of, of the DNA. So do I get paid for making such historic discoveries? Uh, Nobel Prize winners get, I think it's a million dollars to go towards their research. So uh, yeah, getting a Nobel Prize gets you big money. And making big scientific discoveries gets you, um, you know, research funding and the support of universities and stuff like that. So yeah, you can, you can make good dollars if you're making scientific discoveries. It is cool. Now, scientific discovery is the foundation of innovation. Okay, so whenever, you know, new technology comes out, it is the result of, of some type of innovation, which quite often is uh, due to scientific discovery. Um, a lot of electronics operate on principles that were discovered um, in connection to quantum physics. So if we didn't have quantum physics, we wouldn't have the, the type of processing power that, well, if we didn't have the understanding of quantum physics, I guess I should say, we wouldn't have uh, the same level of, of computing power that exists, you know. And, you know, back in the old days, you used to have these giant TVs with vacuum tubes in them um, on cathode rays, basically, to produce a picture. Uh, but as technology developed due to you know greater and greater understandings of science you go, get to your plasma screens and your your LED screens etc and I like plasma screens they're fun to play games on okay so back on topic uh, science is awesome. <clears throat> well, um, because this is sort of a, a public recording and whatnot, I, I can't really get into religious discussions. Um, but uh, I can just venture forth that, that I am also a Christian. All right. And I believe that a person can be a good scientist and a Christian. I see no incompatibility between those two. Anyway, so um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, these are the four bases. All right. And we remember that the top two, adenine and guanine, are our purines, and the bottom two, cytosine and thymine, are the pyrimidines. Okay, and which ones are going to pair together? Well, adenine is going to double bond with thymine, and cytosine actually triple bonds to guanine. Now, proteins and amino acids. Proteins are made up of amino acids, and all amino acids consist of a central carbon atom called the alpha carbon, uh, amino groups, a um, hydrogen atom, hydrogen, it shouldn't be hydrogen, it should be hydrogen, that's silly. Anyway, and a carboxyl group and a side chain. Uh, the bond that joins two amino acids together is referred to as a peptide bond. Now, there are 20 different amino acids that make up millions of proteins. Different combos of the 20 amino acids can make up millions of proteins. Now, what should also be mentioned here is that the proteins can be made up of different lengths, 
of amino acid chains. Uh, you know, 50 amino acids is a would be a very small protein. Uh, 300, you need to have about 300 amino acid um, groups together in a chain to produce the three-dimensional, well, I guess they're all three-dimensional in some ways, but um, there are certain types of, of proteins that are referred to as, as three-dimensional proteins that require more um, amino acids, and they will fold in a very intricate way to produce um, you know, a certain type of functionality. <clears throat> okay, so protein structure, the tertiary structure protein, you can have um, proteins that consist of aggregates of tertiary structures. So here we have, you know, one structure, but it can be combined with another one uh, to increase the functionality, basically. Now the DNA structure, it's a, a double helix, a twisted ladder. So the sugar and phosphate molecules make up the backbone. So here where we see these sort of burgundy-ish parts, uh, that's the backbone. But then connect to the backbone, sort of like rungs, are the nitrogen bases. So here you can see C and G, G and C, they're bounded together, T and A, A and T. So your adenine and thymine are bonding, your guanine and your cytosine are bonding. Now the nitrogen bases are connected with uh, hydrogen bonds that are not very strong, okay, compared to an ionic bond or something like that. And um, they form between the positive end of one molecule and the negative end of the other. Now the backbone becomes twisted, which makes the molecule look like this staircase. Now the genetic code is is not the the phosphate backbone or the sugar phosphate backbone. It is the nitrogen bases that are really making up the code. Okay, and one pair you can refer to as like a rung of the ladder. Okay, and then you have the deoxyribose sugar that is connected to the bases, and then the phosphates that help make up the the, the backbone portion. So here you can see the, the structure of um, adenine and thymine bonding together. So here you can see the double bond. There's a hydrogen bonding with, with uh, an oxygen and then a hydrogen bonding with nitrogen. And both of those are hydrogen bonds. Now you have three of those when you're talking about cytosine and guanine. So a triple bond. Okay. And so the sugar part... This is going to be part of the DNA backbone. The base is connected here. That's the base, and then you'd have your cytosine base, your guanine base. Now, evidence that genes are DNA. Um, in 1952, experiments of Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey uh, infecting bacterial cells with viruses named bacterial phages. Now these are small virus-like organisms that depend on the host cell machinery for their replication. And here you actually have a picture. Look at that little guy go. So this is the bacterial phage on top. And he basically injects uh, DNA into the host cell. And then that DNA hijacks, hijacks the genetic machinery to produce more copies of, of the virus. So here you have a bacterial phage, this is called a T2 phage, and there's the protein coat and inside the DNA. So it's almost like a little hypodermic needle. They're kind of cool. Okay, and they inject their DNA. Now once the, the DNA is put in there, so it infects the host, and then it replicates lots of bacterial phages, which produces a whole bunch of, um, you know, of the protein coat and and injection mechanisms and uh, then because they replicate you know to a large extent very rapidly you'll actually burst the cell and release the new phages to um, you know to attack the new cell now I've always thought there was potential to use bacterial phages as a type of antibiotic and they actually do use them now 
against um, bacterial infections in, in cows and in, in livestock. Now, I don't know if they're doing it with human beings yet, um, but I think there's, there's a potential there because the bacterial phages are uh, quite host-specific, so they will only go after certain bacteria, which means they're not a threat to the DNA of, uh, or to the cells of, say, a human being, right? Anyway, um, in this study, Jason Hershey asked the question, what substance was direct or directed the production of the new phage, the, the DNA or the protein? Well, they concluded it was DNA because the protein stayed outside the cell. It was only DNA that went in. So the central dogma of how DNA works, uh, it replicates. So one DNA strand will unzip and can produce a new DNA strand. And then also transcription occurs. So basically the information in the DNA is translated, well, first of all transcribed, I guess, into RNA and then translated into a protein. Now we are going to be talking more in depth about these processes, replication, transcription, and translation, but not today. This is just sort of in or introducing the basic structure of DNA and some of the, the background to it. All right. I'm so happy everything worked well today. Uh, any questions? Excellent. Okay, I'm just going to turn off the recording.